as you heard, I'm a plastic surgeon here in Denmark. Uh, I'm here because two and a half years ago, my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer. And uh, because I'm a doctor and because I was highly motivated, I was able to optimize her treatment beyond standard care. I didn't buy expensive new treatments. I just modified daily life drugs in favor of a better outcome. So the wife of a doctor has better treatment options than most other people. And I have this idea to a tool that will enable any doctor to do exactly what I did for my wife. It took months of research for me to find that information, but with the right tool, your doctor can do that in a minute. I will try to illustrate how the tool could work, and I will discuss why it challenges the way we usually think in medicine, but also why, of course, I think we should have it anyway. But first, some basics on drug approvals. Drugs pass several stages of testing, and it's a long process that can easily take 10 years. During the years, the results are being published in the scientific literature, which is where I did my research. But there is this 10-year gap between the early immature results and until the final results end up on the doctor's table. I was able to tap into that because I'm a doctor, but it's very heavy reading and impossible for most people. So here's what I did. I took a look on my wife's chemotherapy. What kind of drugs could I use to treat the chemo side effects? And would that affect the chemo itself? Prednisolone was part of the chemo against allergy. And uh, prednisolone, together with intense stress, can induce a stomach ulcer. So I decided to treat my wife with stomach ulcer medicine as a preventive measure. Surprisingly, I found a phase two study showing that a particular type of stomach ulcer medicine could enhance almost double the effect of my wife's first chemo. And all the other studies strongly suggested a beneficial effect on, on her radiotherapy. So, but not all stomach ulcer medicines did that. Apparently, I started my wife on one that did not show that effect, so I shifted her to one that did. It's common during chemo to get a skin rash, so I also used allergy pills or antihistamines uh, as prevention. A Swedish study including all 54,000 cancer, breast cancer patients from 2000 to 2008, showed that patients who incidentally took a particular antihistamine during treatment had a 30% better survival rate. This type of study is usually not considered important unless it includes a lot of patients. And 54,000 is a lot of patients, so I chose that particular allergy pill. In a life crisis like this, sleeping difficulties are also common. And I looked into that and found a phase two study showing that met, uh, melatonin, or what we call the, the jet lag pill, had the potential to cut the risk of cancer recurrence in half for the most aggressive types of, of breast cancer. So as a sleeping pill, melatonin would be the obvious choice. And finally, my wife took a raw, natural cannabis oil against chemo side effects. It's, by the way, legally in Denmark, and it worked very well. I fell upon this animal study showing that cannabis could enhance the effect of human breast cancers implanted in mice. Well, of course, my wife's not a mouse, but the chemotype was actually the same. So I might have encouraged a little higher dose than just for the side effects. But that frankly made a stone, so and she didn't like that. <laughs> Some do. She didn't like it. Uh, so after a couple of chemo series, she went down to a minimal dose. But then the tumor started to grow despite chemotherapy. Apparently, cancers can develop resistance towards chemo, much like bacteria do to penicillin. So 
we got scared, of course, and she increased the dose of cannabis again. And from then on, the tumor went back to shrinking. Well, when I planned this talk, I actually thought I would leave out this story because cannabis is controversial and it, I, I was afraid it would steal the picture. On the other hand, chemo resistance is absolutely no joke. It's one of the biggest problems in oncology. So, in the spirit of this talk, I decided to be positive and share this personal case story. So, back to the tool and how it works. Let's try it on the audience here in the Frederiksberg. Some of you may have lifestyle conditions like hypertension, high cholesterol, diabetes. Uh, you probably don't like taking pills, so you don't. You have one of those nice doctors who doesn't put pressure on you, which is nice. With the right tool, your doctor could point out that metformin and simvastatin against high cholesterol and diabetes may actually prevent cancer. As for hypertension, most of you here have this light skin color uh, with a disposition towards both skin cancer and, and melanoma, I'm sorry. Uh, would you like your doctor to know that drug A against hypertension may increase your risk of skin cancer and drug B may lower your risk of melanoma? You see, I'm not suggesting that we start a treatment based on immature evidence. I'm suggesting that when faced with equal treatment options, let's be intelligent and creative about this. A drug is typically approved for one or two things, but it has secondary effects and sometimes just happens to work on cancer. We can use those secondary effects to our benefit. So that's the basic concept here. But it's a very difficult concept to promote to a scientist, and that's really why I'm talking to you. Um, asking... <laughs> thank you. Asking a scientist to use immature evidence, I, I imagine will make him feel quite naked. And the best I can do is being this, you know, overly positive one going, listen, you're not naked. You have a hat. You have a sock. That's better than nothing if you use those creatively. <laughs> and besides, we all have to get used to the concept of using immature evidence. The way things are going, on, on one hand, we have the evidence level behind the real cancer drugs. It's actually decreasing these years due to increasing market pressure. And on the other hand, we have these new techniques rapidly discovering more and more of our daily life drugs having some level of anti-cancer properties. And that together with modern societies struggling with increasing healthcare costs just doesn't make sense not to utilize secondary effects of ordinary drugs. These daily life drugs with anti-cancer properties are called repurposed drugs, and it's an extremely interesting area of, of cancer research. Being well known already, they are low risk, they are low cost, and, and there's only good things to say here, except that the drug patents have expired, so there's no big money to fund clinical trials. And that explains why the evidence level is often immature or pre-phase three, as we say. And it also explains why you probably haven't heard about this before. So how do we build a tool to optimize daily life drugs, utilize those secondary effects on cancer? We already have the basic structure to, the, to do that in something called drug interaction databases. Now, what is a drug interaction? A drug interaction is when one drug affects another. Often they don't, but if they do, it can be critical. So drug agencies make these databases where doctors can cross-check a patient's medication and see if the whole package goes together. The functionality is great. In Denmark, we have 
when a doctor prescribes a drug, we have these pop-up windows coming up warning us about possible interactions. Sometimes the warning leads us to reduce the dosage, or sometimes we choose another drug, but usually it's just a reminder and not important in that particular case. But what is completely unique about drug interaction databases is the level of evidence behind them. Usually, in medicine, we strive for the highest level of evidence, but these databases are remarkably inclusive. They're so obsessed with reducing risk that sometimes a warning is based on just a single patient case story. And I mean, case stories, like our cannabis story. It's among the lowest levels of evidence we have. Imagine that level of consideration. The, the preservation and utilization of all that knowledge that we actually have. One patient, and we, we have pop-up windows all over the place. So, when it comes to do no harm, this system can do it. Can really do it. I just wish we could do the same when it comes to doing good. I, I would like to see pop-up windows whenever there's a chance to do something good for a patient. A positive or beneficial drug interaction database. Take, take for example, all daily life drugs. Find their beneficial effects on chemotherapy, radiotherapy, immunotherapy, or cancer surgery, and cancer itself. With a tool like that, your doctor could optimize your daily life drugs in a minute in favor of a better cancer outcome, or in favor of whatever good outcome of any disease we might expand this concept to. And that is my idea. A positive drug effects tool. Now, getting this idea was the easy part. As with most innovations, the, the, the tricky part is who's going to make this tool and, and how. And I'm divided myself here. On one hand, I would love this tool in the system. On the other hand, well, the system is extremely conservative, so it will take years and years. The problem with a commercial developer would be that in the end, Patients need doctors to modify those drugs. They need the doctor to believe in this idea. They, this, they need a system with a positive mindset. Science has served us amazingly, of course, with its skepticism. But sometimes the lack of positivity can be absurd. Take a patient with incurable disease. The patient holds on to hope. And the doctor seeks safe haven in evidence-based medicine and goes, there's nothing more to be done. Killing the hope, perhaps. I suppose that was okay if it was true, right? But it's not. It's more like, <laughs> there probably is something to be done, but we're all academically vain here, so I can't tell you. I think the least our system can do, even when giving up, is pointing in a direction of hope. I don't care who does it. I don't care who does it. I think maybe doctors should decide for themselves. It's a very personal case. But we will need that tool to do it. Fortunately, these days, all kinds of health information end up in smartphone applications, so I suppose I'll just wait and see who comes first, the system or private enterprise. Either way, I look forward to my first pop-up window saying, Dear Doc, if you consider a type of drug like this, I suggest drug A instead of drug B, because it may prolong your patient's life. And the day my patient goes, Thank you, doctor. But I 
kind of already knew because I have this smartphone application. <laughs> that day, I will be able to treat all my patients to the very best of my abilities and not just my wife.